Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Wes is nodding because he is one of these experts, so he's going to talk to us today and founder of Ezonomy. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Wes Grudsian. I've been practicing your name for a few days now. It's, he's co-founder of Lullaby Lane. Wes helped grow the company's Amazon sales to over $7 million annually in less than three years. That's amazing, Wes. And he's also founder of Ezonomy, where he teaches the exact methods used to grow the seven-figure business and consults with large-scale sellers. Wes, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. And you know, you've, you're like the most lovable person. And we'll get into some of your fun facts. Like You have some crazy fun facts about you which we'll talk about, but I want to get into a few of the, I mean, I just said some mind blowing things for some people, for myself, you know, growing to $7 million annually in less than three years. So I, I have to start with that. And so what have, what do you think has created or created some of the biggest leaps in the huge jump in revenue in, in just three years? Sure. Sure. No, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think our, our ability to grow was, directly impacted by our uh, access to inventory. Mm -hmm. And so with Amazon, a lot of times you have, you have three major uh, ways you can basically sell on Amazon. Retail arbitrage, which is literally going out to a store, buying something uh, on clearance and selling it. You have uh, private labeling, which is contracting with companies in China mm -hmm. to you know, design products for yourself. And then you have companies like us that contract directly with branded uh, with brands, branded manufacturers, uh, and sell those products. And so the beautiful part about that is that the products that we sell, we don't really have to create too much of a demand, a demand for them right. because the demand is already there. Right. All we have to do is be very good at putting those products in front of the customer's eyes because that's what they want. That's what right. they're searching for. Right. So that's, you know, that is, is definitely the number one reason why we've been able to scale to the size that we have in the time that we have. Yeah. I mean, with the branded and, you know, component, there's, you know, there's people out there who are also selling these brands and they're not as successful as you. So what separates what you're doing from, from them? Sure. Sure. Um, it's a great question. Uh, interestingly enough, I would say one of the, the major, uh, reasons is we actually just put traditional business practices in place. I know it sounds maybe simple, but you know a lot of times you can get lost in the just volume and the hype and the excitement that you know maybe you don't put those traditional you know uh, practices in place. So we have uh, you know budgets that we work from. We have um, uh, buying cycles. We have inventory reconciliation. You know it's all the the parts of a traditional business maybe not through Amazon, that, that I think make a, a, a great difference. Yeah, it's the non-sexy stuff that actually works. Exactly. It's the foundational principles on which you know, any business is, is, is based. It's, you can't get away from those pretty much no matter where you are or whatever you do or yeah. where you sell. Yeah, so Wes, speak to one of those because one of, what is one of those foundational principles that most people get wrong or don't, they aren't doing? No, it's a, that's, a, that's a great, great point. Probably our, our, our number one, I would say, is um, creating an area of focus. And this is particularly for Amazon in yeah. that, you know, if you sell everything on Amazon, that's fine. And there's some people that do that and yeah. have that business model. But we believe that if you sell everything, you're not really an expert at anything. So by focusing in the category that we did, which is yeah. baby, you know, we build relationships with manufacturers. We build relationships with our distributors, with our, I know, our um uh, transportation companies uh, were able to understand the market and not just not just go on Amazon and see you know what's a good selling product and sell that we're able to look at that and create an opportunity that is not currently on Amazon by having that information and we do that because we know the market we know what people are looking for right. and it's it's proactive instead of reactive basically right right so how did you I mean we're gonna go in more detail later but I have to ask like how'd you even get into babies you know 
Well, we have a we have a, a prior. Uh, there's four partners in our company, yeah. uh, and we have another small business that we originally started, which was direct e-commerce, only e-commerce, basically drop shipping, and uh, we're pretty successful at that. But the problem is there was a real market cap. It was mostly uh, small niche medical supplies. Mm. Um, right around that same time, we were looking for uh, new avenues, new areas of growth, and it's a classic story in our industry. But you know, my partner, him and his wife, got pregnant, so they started looking at strollers right. and realized uh, she wanted this uh, $700 stroller that they had to drive an hour and a half to even just go look at. Right. So we're like, huh? You know, did a little research on the market and realized there's a there's a nice opportunity there. Uh, kind of for that niche. That's that's definitely how we got into it. Was the foundation early on working with your in your dad's business too? I mean, we won't talk about that now. But was that okay? So we'll talk about like what your dad's business was and some of the things you did with that. Um, so we talked about some of the the big leaps. So it's putting those foundational principles. So what's another one? So you said you you mentioned a bunch. What's another important one that most people miss or, or don't do? Sure, sure. Um, I say planning, planning out uh, not only financially, so looking at your cash flow, looking at you know profitability, but also planning uh, new products. Because the other thing about Amazon is that you know it's almost like the stock market in that you know there's ups and downs, dramatic shifts. You know you gain new products, you lose products, so you always have to have products waiting in the yeah. wings and manufacturers waiting in the wings that you might not be actively pursuing, yeah. but building that foundational relationship. So when the time comes when maybe you you know you 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 lose the ability to sell a certain brand or line for whatever reason, uh, you know that new company is there and you just you know start selling that. So you always have you know you always have products waiting in the wings for you. Yeah. So. so you always have like a pipeline of, of new things that you're looking at. What's your yeah. method for, go, like you said, they're very capital intensive, especially looking on your site, like low by lane. You know, strollers are not like a $30 product. I mean, they're, five, they're hundreds of dollars. So what's your method for deciding, okay, this is even deserves to be in my pipeline for new product and then getting to that point where you decide to release it? Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, like you mentioned with our, our direct website, Lullaby Lane, one of our, you know, philosophies is we, we only sell really high quality baby products. And so, you know, we, we identify that. And then the other part of it is that selling direct, or excuse me, um, buying directly from manufacturers and yeah. being a value to them within the industry allows you to have terms. So you can negotiate credit mm -hmm. terms. Uh, and you really leverage those credit terms to build the business. That's you know that's one of the other fo areas we really focus on is increasing our credit terms with our manufacturers because that directly you know correlates. The more credit you have, the more product you can buy, the more product you can sell, the more money, and it's just an, you know a, a virtuous cycle. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, so what about new products? Like when you vet new products, you know, because I'm thinking, okay. There's only so many strollers out there, or baby bottles, or whatever. But you're constantly coming up with new products. Where do you start in your thought process of coming up with those new product ideas? Sure. Well, being in you know one category, the baby category, we have two major trade shows a year, so okay. we spend a lot of time at the trade shows. Yeah. Talking to people, you know, working with our our manufacturers' representatives, yeah. identifying upcoming brands, you know, upcoming products, and we try to get it in here. And uh, really, you know, use it. We have moms in the store that work in the store. We have moms that work in the, you know, in the in the office in the warehouses here. So, um, you know, personally vetting the product and and trying to also look at that product's placement within the market. So it's is it a niche? Is it a me too? Is it uh, you know really just trying to understand not just on Amazon, but what's the what's the what, what's the dynamic of that specific product? Yeah. No, I like what you mentioned about the trade shows because you probably get a lot of different ideas and. Can you tell me about the last trade show or one of the trade shows that you were like, wow, like you saw something, it just stuck out to you that you probably would have never figured out if you hadn't gone to a trade show? Sure, sure. Well, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, with the, the baby show, which ABC Baby is is ABC Home and or Baby and Kids show. It's in Las Vegas, uh, the fall show every year. Um, we... Uh, there was a really cause a couple years ago, but it was it was there's a company called Four Moms, and they are a you know newer company. They have a stroller that you push a button, and it automatically folds wow. for you, and then you That's press cool. the button, 
you know, automatically unfolds. I was like, man, that is, you know, that's that's just crazy. So it's Bluetooth know. enabled. It's it's a uh, it's a um, oh, uh, iPhone hookup. Uh, has lights on it. Has you know everything. All the bells and whistles. You got oh, it. That's cool. Um, and so. What other mistakes do you see? I mean, obviously, with Ezonomy, you're doing a lot of consulting. What are other people doing that is working really well that when you're talking to them? And then on the flip side, what do you tell them as far as directing them away from certain mistakes that they may be making? Sure, sure. Well, you know, uh, it's very popular right now, particularly through the Amazon to uh, create private label products. And yeah. so with, you know, Alibaba coming up, it's very, very simple, relatively speaking, process of identifying a product, buying it from China, listing it, and putting it on Amazon. Yeah. Um, you know, the 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 upside is that there are so many niches that there's still a market out there to be pretty successful. Right. Um, you know, one of the 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 things that I've seen that that folks have been doing that it may not be the best is. They are shipping the product directly to Amazon's fulfillment centers without testing it mm. and without you know getting their hands on it. And right. that's and that sounds good. And in practice, it saves you shipping costs and whatnot. But again, going back to those traditional business principles right. and practices, you want to make sure you put quality assurance checks in place. Right, right. You know, and you're if you don't and the manufacturer sends a you know poorly produce product and you get a ton of negative reviews on these products, you're really going to be risking the health of your account. Yeah, that's a great point. So do you suggest people send a small sample size to them first and then Amazon or do they, should they send the whole shipment to themselves? What, what do you suggest? Sure, there's a couple different ways you can do it depending on your business. I mean, the simplest way probably is to work with your manufacturer and have them send a uh, sample of that exact lot of product that's been produced to you first and then when you green light it then they send directly to Amazon's fulfillment centers. Uh, the safest way which is what we would do, we don't do private label but if we did um, we would have it shipped all directly to our warehouse because you know even if they put just the wrong sticker all of a sudden the products listed under the wrong listing you have you know dozens if not hundreds of returns it just turns into a giant mess so yes on the front end it may cost you a little more in shipping but on the back end it's a peace of mind and a sense of security uh, uh, you know that you're not risking something major with your business. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, quality control is huge. And then, so Wes, you know, you bring up a really good point. I like how you separate the arbitrage to the private label, to, you know, to the branded, you know, the manufacturer. Um, talk about that because people have very different opinions on. Some people are like, no, I don't want to compete with everyone else by selling the same product. I want to do private label, and then the, you know, the brand is like. This is quality stuff. We are. It's already trusted. It's already selling. So, talking about the private label side, um, when people bring up that about, okay, well, there's, you know, it's my brand, so I'm not competing with, you know, other people selling the exact same thing. Sure, you know that's 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 a that's a good point. The the issue that you there's there's positives and there's negatives of right. each styles, right? So with retail arbitrage. You know, you're probably your profitability is higher than any other area. Really? But oh have, wow! Yeah, but you have a depending on how you know how deeply you you search and, and dig for product. You know, your per unit profitability is significantly higher. However, hmm. you have time cost associated. <laughs> it's so horrible. Do you want to spend, yeah. yeah. Do you want to spend uh, uh, you know seven days a week, five six hours a day hunting for product? If you do, great. That's but that's you know that's not my that's not my avenue. So it's profit. <laughs> right. But it's it's a difficult. Um, the private labelers. That is true. That uh, you are your own brand and you're your own product. Uh, there's two issues that you run into with that. Yeah. One is that you have people that jump on your listings uh, that are maybe even the exact uh, manufacturer in China that is producing your product because there are programs and there are folks that do that. They literally contact these manufacturers in China and they say, hey, we can help you sell direct on Amazon for products that are already being sold. Mm, gotcha. That's one issue. There's, there's ways around that as well. Uh, the second issue is that there are courses out there which are great and they've helped folks, but they teach you the exact step-by-step -step process for uh, private labeling. And so that's great for the first group and maybe the second and the third and the fourth, but you have waves of folks coming in doing this, identifying the same product. So yes, you may be the only person that has a you know, wide-handled spatula under your brand, but 
you know, there are possibly eight, ten other listings of wide handled spatulas that are the exact same product. They're just a different brand. Right, so right. in a sense, that's going more to that eBay model than it is to the Amazon model of all sellers on one on one listing. Yeah, and so the positive side of the the branded, um, you go going director to manufacturers. Obviously, there's a credibility. You know, there's a demand there. Um, any disadvantages? Absolutely, absolutely. They all, you know, the the disadvantage is that you have less control over your pricing, and so mm. you know, you if you're buying from a manufacturer, you know, they a lot of times, particularly for your, you know. Well sought after items. There is a minimum price that you're able to sell the the product for. Mm, I gotcha. Uh, yep, and uh, your your margins typically are thinner than if you're working private label or if you're in retail arbitrage. So you have to be of the mindset of of volume. Now you still have to be profitable, but your profitability is going to be less. So there's definitely you know that's the negative of that is you have to do a lot more volume. Uh, to to be uh, as profitable, but the volume is there. I'd say the benefit of that, though, is that one of the things we've done and we've leveraged is that, you know, when we started off, we were a baby company. We we're a small retailer. We had like a 1,200 square foot store. Right. You know, our manufacturers labeled us as a small retailer, a mom and pop shop. Okay, yeah. that is a label that you get in our industry. When you start buying tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of product a month, all of a sudden these manufacturers say, "Huh, they're not really a small, you know, small potato anymore." Yeah. So from that, we've been able to leverage better pricing, better terms, and that actually helps us on our channel outside of Amazon. So you know, mm. that's definitely benefited our our own website. When you have you know better terms, you can get more aggressive with some of your pricing or with some of your discounts or promotions that normally you wouldn't have. If you didn't have the sales volume that we had through Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So talk about with the branded on Amazon specifically about the buy box. You know, because I mean, I don't know how it works. Do they let only a certain number of people sell that particular? you know, baby stroller or whatever the case is. So um, I imagine there's other people selling it. How how do people get the buy box so that when someone's purchasing it, they're purchasing it from you? Sure. So that's, that's a great question. So the first thing is that, uh, you know, every person's experience is different. But our personal experience is that we don't sell against Amazon retail for anything. So uh, if Amazon retail sells that product, that's great. Uh, it, it creates awareness, but we won't sell that under that listing. We might create a bundle or we might do mm. an alternate product listing or something that adds value to the customer. Um, so you're saying if, if the manufacturer sells directly to Amazon in bulk and Amazon sells it through their own channel, then you won't sell it. You're, you won't also sell it unless it's in a bundled situation. Right. We won't sell under that same ASIN. Okay. Right? Amazon folks out there, Got it. and that same listing, we'll, yeah. we'll create a separate listing that adds value, and that's, you know, that's again one of the other kind of things that we do are keys uh, keys to the kingdom on how to understand how to build those bundles and what what makes sense. Yeah, what else? What other factors affect the buy box, in your opinion? Well, like I mentioned, a lot of a lot of the uh, products we we sell are pr map pricing or minimum advertised pricing. So basically. Everyone is supposed to sell the product at the same price. That's yeah. there's there's almost right, no right. Yeah, there's almost no competitive advantage uh, if you don't deal with price. If all you're dealing with are people that do fulfillment by Amazon, right. so it, it's it's somewhat of a negative, but it's also positive because if we look at a listing on Amazon and uh, we use our we use a software that calculates sales volume, right, per units per units per month. Mm -hmm. If we know the sales volume and we know the price and we know the number of FBA sellers, uh, we can calculate how much uh, gross sales we're going to be doing on a monthly basis mm. for that product without even having to sell that product. That's amazing. Yeah. So you can forecast what your growth is going to look like over three or six months by using, you know, kind of using that formula. Yeah. So I feel sorry for people competing with you. You have this whole formula in place. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's software tools and we just we've been doing it for a while, you know, and I'm sure other people do it too. You know, you kinda know the other big sellers in your area. We know there's, you know, probably four or five other uh, larger sellers right. uh, 
that do similar things to we do. Yeah, well, there's a reason they're larger sellers because they're doing these things. But um, so I don't know if you can share. We can have a software conversation later. But can you talk about what what was that software you're talking about that does that calculation or reprice or calculates it? Sure, sure. Well, there's 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 multiples that you can use. Everyone's got their you know got their own brand. But basically, the software goes in and looks at the sales rank of the product. Mm -hmm. And they know from historical data how many units uh, are sold because of that sales rank. Mm -hmm. And so we use, you know, Jungle Scout. There's AMZ Tracker. There, there's multiple ones out mm -hmm. there that uh, give you that data. And that's right. what's really important is getting the data, as you know, as opposed to right. how you get it. So yeah. and the other calculation of, um, you know, expected volume if we we're to become an FBA seller of that product is just that's internal. I mean, there's there's nothing. It's just you know, sales volume divided by uh, uh, FBA sellers. Right. You know, you're bringing up, you're not even letting me get to your fun facts, Wes, because you're bringing up some really good points. You know, the other point you brought up was bundles. This is really intriguing, and I find a lot of people aren't doing these things. What do you find works for a good bundle? No, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, it's definitely some of the stuff that I work with my, uh, as a consultant, what I work with some of the companies I'm doing, yeah. uh, this exact thing. Um, you know, what, what you want to find is, yeah, what'd you advise someone? What uh, what did they come with? Did they have no bundles? And, and what did you tell them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, as for a for a retail seller or a seller that you know contracts directly with brands, what you want to do is find a high ranking base product. So the main product of the of the listing. So for example, with us, if there's a popular stroller, okay, what what you want to do is identify that listing. You can kind of you can tell what the sales are on that, and then identify the the secondary product that that goes with it so yeah. for example uh, we have a stroller that yeah. uh, is sold individually but it has a second seat you know it just yeah makes sense. yeah I saw that on your site yeah. yeah yeah it's like on the home page it's like it's like front and center like I didn't even realize that was possible and it's like shows you how you can add another one yeah that's really cool so Amazon retail buys that stroller and buys the second seat and sells them both but they don't sell them together. Mm. So it's just a, you know, it's 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 in somewhat a common sense thing. Makes uh, sense. Yeah. There's there's a there's on the Amazon pages there's uh, what's called frequently bought together products. Right. So right. Take a look at those. Maybe that's something. It's a that great suggestion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or and you know again focusing on one industry in one area allows us to do that. So we create some pretty unique bundles yeah. that aren't. Uh, frequently bought together, or maybe uh, you know, intuitive that are pretty successful because of what we understand, you know, how the market works. Yeah, and you have moms that you probably talk to, and they're like, "Oh, it makes perfect sense in your mind." So, what's the most popular bundle that um, you've created, and or that you've advised someone else to create? Sure. Well, like I mentioned early on. Uh, of our conversation, you know, you always got to have products in the pipeline. So this product, Amazon Retail, does sell now. So mm. we we don't really sell this one much anymore. Mm. But it was what I was telling you about the stroller with the second seat, and the retail on the product was about six hundred and fifty dollars. And at one point in our peak, we were, we were running about mm, eighty five thousand dollars a month in wow. sales on that one listing. That's amazing. So, Amazon sucks. They took it over. What happened? Yeah, you, know, you know, it's it's that is that is the uh, marketplace. You know, that is right. that's part of Amazon. Listen, Amazon retail. It's their ball. It's their court. It's their rules. Right. You know, they're going to track what's popular for their third party sellers. Right. And they're going to try to take it. I mean, that <laughs> is horrible. That's the nature of the beast. Yeah. You got. You know, if you complain about that, it's part of the game. <laughs> It is that you just have that's part of doing business. That's part of it. So you know, have product lined up and, and ready to go when you know that happens. So then, how do we get them buying more on your site? Like, how does that work? Well, you know, Amazon pretty strictly forbids uh, driving traffic off of their site to your own website. Mm -hmm. So we don't, you know, we don't do that. We, you know, outside of Amazon, we do some Facebook marketing. Right, that's what I mean, like outside of Amazon. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm really, really blessed to have four, the four of us total, or three very smart partners. Yeah. Each has their own strength 
And uh, one of my partners is very gifted in uh, marketing, Facebook marketing, digital marketing in mm -hmm, general. Mm -hmm. So we've seen some uh, some pretty some pretty you know nice gains from that. Yeah. Um, you know so the other thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The other thing that we've we've gotten is from our relationship with uh, one of our manufacturers, building it through Amazon. You know, we kind of became close. Uh, we had an opportunity when the Affordable Care Act was implemented. To um, what happened was it's a federal mandate for healthcare plans to provide a breast pump at no cost to moms, yeah. and so that seems kind of simple. But we actually, like you were talking about with my father's company in the past, had the ability to build these healthcare uh, providers, and so from that relationship on Amazon, we leveraged that to create a new. A website and a completely new business sending out breast pumps and billing these insurances. So, you know, that in in a sense it's an indirect but a way to market to our own site, but in a sense it's also direct because of that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into that a little bit too. I wanted that was I gonna ask you is your four partners. So what is the unique skill that everyone brings to the table? Sure, sure. Well one of them is uh, my father and so he um, you know, he's, he's just been around a long time and yeah. he had his own business and he's very, he's a smart guy. So, you know, intuitional things or gut reaction things yeah. that go to him. Yeah. So what's his superpower in your mind? He has the ability to look out and kind of see what's going to happen quite mm -hmm. a bit. Because he has so much experience that he can kind of see trends yep. easier than other people. Yeah. So he's, he's good at, good for that for Got sure. It. Um, one of our other partners is was also a very successful businessman. He, you know, bought his uh, uh, bought a business, uh, grew it from about 25 employees to 130 employees in wow. five years, and uh, ended up selling it. So he actually uh, made an investment in our company. So he's actually an angel investor. Mm. He wasn't the original investors, but um, you know, he put a sizable amount of uh, of money into our company, and you know, that's great. But I would say even more important is just been his experience and yeah. knowledge in terms of growing a business because that's yeah. what we're doing. You know, Dad's company was about the same size for quite a while. This other gentleman, Tim, he did it. I mean, he took it, like I said, from small to large, yeah. um, you know, and sold his business. So he has an amazing wealth of knowledge yeah. that we've been able to tap into. And then our. Well, wait, stop on Tim for a second, Wes. So tell me, what is your favorite or best advice you've gotten from Tim or that you've heard him say? Uh, that's a great that's a that's a great question um so much in terms of at, uh, in terms of the amazon piece yeah which I, I i thought was very very smart i what one of the things he says is control the controllables and that's one of the things i use with my clients mm. as well now, yeah talk about that yeah there's so much that you're not in control of on amazon you know, right. amazon does the you know uh marketing the search engine you know basically it, everything outside of having the product. So you're very limited in what you can control. Yeah. So you have to focus on at least controlling the things that are in your power. Yeah. So what did that mean to you? What were you what were you like, okay, what can you control? Uh I mean, that's a great, great question. It's like when we were before he came on, how we would buy. So how we go about buying inventory. Um, you know, you can you can there's a couple there's many ways you can do it, but we at first were buying, you know, two or three months worth of inventory and then you know, basically sitting on this inventory. So you'd get almost this bullwhip effect of inventory levels. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's I'm sure it's very common. Most people probably do is. that. Absolutely. And yeah. the problem is that you can get really get into cash flow issues yeah. when you do that. If you time it incorrectly yeah. and you know, you have a million dollars out in, in payables with sure. your manufacturers yeah. and some you gotta sell that stuff. Yeah. You can't pay the taxes in strollers, exactly, or pay the bills in strollers. Oh. So, you know, going to a bi weekly ordering pattern really helped. Uh, you know, solve a lot of those issues. So that's you know, just one example of where So is that like a tracking thing or what where do where was the issue with buying in bulk like t a timing thing like then you tracked of okay at this point we know the lead time when the stroller gets delivered so we know we have to order what was the the change that you had to make so it wasn't so like up and down uh yeah that's uh the weekly just getting on a cadence of accountability so instead of you know buying and then kind of not watching it for a while and saying, oh crap, I need to buy it again. I see. It's, it's okay, we're going to look every two weeks, we're going to check this, mm. 
you know, we're going to check this every day and track this, and then two weeks from now we're going to create a purchase order, then we're going to do this. And it's just putting, again, those fundamental business I see. basics in that allowed a lot of that success. I see. So before it would be like, okay, I ordered this bulk amount. I probably don't have to look at it for like a month. And no. then now you kind of look and you kind of see, okay, we're selling about this number a week, and you're paying really close attention of how many you need to buy, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the other, you know, you risk, uh, there's other risks that are involved when you buy two or three months worth of inventory as well. You know, if the, something happens to that product listing, you know, you may have to pull all that inventory back. And that is, you know, those are cash monsters. Boy, yeah. those, those just eat up cash. So, yeah. you know, you, by ordering biweekly, you have a lot more free cash flow so you can invest in, you know, more profitable opportunities when they come down the road. Yeah. And, and that, you know, West takes discipline, right? So what do you do to employ those routines in your daily or, or someone else as far as because it's much easier to buy it not look at it for a month and harder to okay we need to check this every week or every few days so what do you that's, do what systems do you put in place that make sure you actually do it or someone does it sure it's interesting that you say that there is an incredible book uh called 4dx or the four disciplines of execution mm. and basically it is uh, it, it talks exactly about that. You know, if you want to, you need to, you need to identify one or two major areas of that of your business that you want improvement on. You need to understand the levers that would create that improvement, mm -hmm. and then you need to create. And again, this is very abridged version, but you need yeah. to create. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's now none of us have to read it, Wes. Just give me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So there's there's <laughs> lag measures which are you know things that happen after you work yeah. and then there's uh, after you've done the work and then there's lead measures things that you do before uh, you know the result happens and so you have a cadence of accountability for those lead measures so we meet once a week talking about what those lead measures are what they've done what we're going to do next week so it really just you know sets a pattern and a precedence for how you go about you know doing your business yeah. now did you discover that just randomly or did someone say you need to to read this um, that was actually uh, my partner. He is a. We're both big, big readers. But he yeah. he came up with that one, and you know, it really inspired him and implemented it within the company. And and you know, I've uh, I've seen the the big change since then. So any, and I want to talk about other partners, but any other good resources or books that you'd be like, if you are in e-commerce business, just business, but I mean, obviously, it's e-commerce. Uh, what should people get? You know, so we have four DX. What other ones are like must must reads? I, I mean, like I say, I read, you know, listen to like three to six Audible books a week. So I'm asking personally too, what else I should be putting in the queue? Oh, yeah, I've got the Audible hookup. That's, yes, that's yes. My, uh, my my thing there. Um, you know, I, I love Jim Collins. Uh, mm -hmm. Did good to great, mm -hmm. great choice. You know, he's he's a, a professor that basically went in and analyzed. Uh, particularly in good to great, why these certain Fortune 500 companies were so good for that certain time period, mm -hmm. and he identified you know common characteristics among each of the companies, yeah. and that were those were kind of his principles of what good to great was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Peter Thiel wrote; he was one of the founders of uh, eBay, I believe. Yeah. Zero to one. Zero to one, yeah. Incredible. I'm book. I'm listening to that right now. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's such a great book. Yeah, that is, that is a great book. Um, you know, any of the lean startup, I mean, there's a whole series of them. It just, you know. It, Anything specific to e-commerce that you could think of? I mean, obviously, these are all business books. I don't even, I can't think of one, any specific to e-commerce sellers. Sure. That's a good question. You know, I, I, I haven't focused specifically on e-commerce um, just because, like I said, we did some of the foundational, mm -hmm. you know, your business is business is business, no matter what you're selling and where you're selling. So yeah. you got to focus on those those things first. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say though that I've recently been getting into um, a gentleman by the name of Ryan Dice and Digital Marketer. Yeah. Uh, he has some pretty fabulous stuff going on, and um, you know it's it's do it yourself. So you're not paying a consultant, you right. know, thousands of dollars to do it. Um, but if you can put in the time and, and it makes sense for you to do it, then yeah, he's you know he's probably uh, maybe safe. Cutting edge, future. leading edge of yeah, marketing. For sure. Yeah, future. for sure. Anyone else that you think other people should be following or looking at online? Uh, you know, I, I've been I've been so trying to just dug into my business right. that 
you know, spend too much time. On smart. Not. That's smart. Your discipline, the 4DX. So I'll stick to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so your dad, Tim, and then who, yes, the next? Ryan, uh, you know. Ryan. Ryan. And he is our managing partner of the Lullaby Lane side. So okay. he has the kind of the day-to-day responsibilities as our CEO, which is beautiful for me because – you know, you have Ryan, who's about my age, a little bit younger. Uh, you know, go getter. I would even call him a visionary in a lot of in a lot of senses. I mean, we've you know we've had multiple businesses that's been you know created. You have him, and then you have Tim, the gentleman who's been there, done that successfully, and then I'm kind of in the middle, and it allows me to kind of be a little free and creative and figure out what you know what makes sense, and that's what you know helped me and allowed me to start Ezonomy is. Is that you know having the freedom? Yeah. And I, I love to, uh, you know, I've been so so caught up in my own business that it's been great. But I also yeah. love to talk with people and educate and communicate. That's one of my passions. Right. And so this has given me an outlet to do that. So, what would you say Ryan's superpower is? <sighs> uh, you know, there's there's not. I I don't use this term lightly, but I you know genius is probably a good. Wow term and the ability to like, tell me give me an example of that so where did you say like normal person and then ryan does something to the site or or did something that you're like this guy's a genius well that he was the person i would say that came up with the the what i mentioned before the breast pump idea mm. and going direct you know okay. s- selling these to people and it's just being able to see how something's going to happen and being slightly different and slightly that it makes a little more sense right. and going to, I don't know if that, that makes sense what I'm trying to say, but you know, just the ability to make connections. That yeah. He put two things together. Like he saw the affordable care act. He saw you already selling breast pumps. And then instead of just doing it the same old way, kind of put them together and, and maybe people would see a lot of uh, obstacles with going direct and maybe dealing with insurances and other things. He saw an opportunity there. Yeah, like tip of the spear kind of thing. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, we have a great group. You know, I think all of us have our own strengths and weaknesses that we bring to the. Yeah, bring to the and team. so you. So, what's your superpower? Uh, you know, I. It's I, the hardest to. I ask you last because it's the hardest to identify our own, and you. You're a very humble person, so I'm going to ask you to, to yeah. just really tell me. You know, with the business, if you think about the business, what what do you? What does everyone else tell you that? Is your superpower? I don't know. I don't don't pay too much attention. <laughs> uh, I a discernment. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, in other words, um, I think that's that's a good skill I have. So discernment would be like if two people are having a conversation. If I, I can sit there and I can watch this conversation and I can pretty clearly understand if they're actually communicating with each other what one person's trying to say, mm-hmm. if the other person's understanding it, what needs to be said. It's almost mm-hmm. a facilitation of an yeah. agreement. Yeah. So that would be that'd probably be one of my... So, of my- Wes, on that note, user feedback. It seems like you do kind of testing. You talk to people who are moms. What's some, like, I don't know if you call it discernment, but um, user feedback that you were talking to some moms and how that created maybe a new product or a thought process that create a new product because I think oftentimes we don't ask our users enough on what they want or what they're they're not liking in certain products sure sure uh, well we had a um, you know it goes back to the bundles and actually that's what inspired some of the bundles early yeah. on it's just folks would say uh, you know you have this set of baby bowls and you know someone would ask hey are the baby spoons or do you have something that you know goes with this and that would that would be great. And so we'd look at that, and you know that that would be a, again another. It's like great. hitting upside your head. You're like, okay, maybe like, we should oh. have our spoons with this. <laughs> well, it's, it's you know can't can't see the can't see the trees through the forest. Right, right. And then so tell me about you know what's also interesting about what you guys do is you do a lot of great content marketing. You know, I look at your blog. You have like baby wearing safety tips or carriage buying guide and, and a lot of different things. So. Who, what's, uh, I guess, the the direction? Who sets the direction of that? And I know, um, I don't know if it's uh, the lady on it, Rachel Sowers is like the, the lady doing it. So tell me her role and then how you decide what to put out as far as content. Sure, goes. sure. Well, you know, kind of from a 30,000 foot perspective, yeah. you to be successful in retail, whether it's online or in the business, you have to create a following. You know, you have to bring value to people. Right. That's what sets you apart. And so, 
you know, uh, the the point of the content is to connect with people, yeah. is to create a community, to con to create value with folks. If you're just trying to sell them a, a stroller or a breast pump, you know, they can get that anywhere. They can get right. that on Amazon. Yeah. They do get that on Amazon, and that's why we Hopefully sell it from you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you want an actual, you know, cr uh, a community where you can, you know, continue to you know, offer products and services and build the lifetime value of a customer, yeah. you've got to get some great content. And so yeah. that's why we, you know, try to focus on content. Uh, so they feel like we're not just, um, you know, we're not just trying to sell them something. Yeah. Delivering I, value. Yeah, I've yeah. said this from the beginning with, with, with our staff is that, you know, when someone comes into the store and they're having their first child, you have the ability to directly impact how well that experience or how good that experience is yeah. by the products that you offer. If you give them something that doesn't work for them, you know, they know that and it could negatively affect some of that experience. And I know that sounds like, uh, you know, grandiose, but in a sense, it, it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. If you give them something that causes issues, you know, that that's directly affected on them. So you have a lot of power in, in, in folks' lives. So you got to take that seriously. Yeah. So what has worked with building the community as far as content goes? Like what, uh, for you guys have the content has worked the, the best? Sure, sure. Well, like you said, with, with blogs, um, you know, that's that's a great part of it. In our, in our retail location, uh, which we have a 7,000 square foot retail location in, in Northwest Ohio, we offer classes. Oh, really? So, okay, cool, yeah. Absolutely. So what like kind of baby, classes? Baby food making classes, um, you know, uh, baby yoga, baby sign language, music classes, and, mm. you know, it's... That's it's amazing, not, yeah. It's, 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 it's not there to, you know, retire off of early. What's the most popular class or most popular two classes? That's a great question. That's, I'd be lying if I said I knew at the moment because I've, my head's been so, uh, you know, buried in the yeah. Amazon piece, so I don't, I don't want to yeah. give you... Is there a, a best guess? I'm just curious. So you have the sign language class, the food making class, what other classes? Uh, um, baby yoga. Um, uh -huh. Uh, baby art, um, probably the probably the music classes would be yeah. popular, uh, most yeah. popular. I, I love that you're talking about this, Wes, because oftentimes when people are focused online, they're not like dealing directly with real people, and so I find adding that component in there is really powerful. Um, do you videotape these classes or anything? Um, not not no. really, just because okay. it's such a personal kind of one almost one on one experience with the with the folks. Yeah. So, but to go with what you're saying, you know, you really have to to be successful. You have to have you know omni channel presence. You have to be right. can't just be your website, can't just be your store, can't just be Amazon. Yeah. You know, actually build your brand. You have to really focus on 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 all of them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I'm gonna you've sidetracked me a lot, but I'm gonna get back on to. Um, kind of from the beginning with your dad's company but before we talk about that and what you did for that and then we that will get into the more of the story with lullaby lane um is your fun fact is crazy you know mm -hmm. and so i wanted to mention that um so you were in bodybuilding competitions and and you also are a trained opera singer so yeah. on the bodybuilding <laughs> front i'm not going to ask you to take off your shirt and flex but, but tell me about it. <laughs> yeah you know um Ever since I, when I was when I was a kid, I always was was heavier. And you know, one day, um, I I've run marathons. I've done other kind of stuff like that. And you know, yeah. just really trying to push push myself. And one day, I said, you know, I want to I want to do a bodybuilding competition. So, uh, you know, I took a couple months and and um, educated myself, researched, and you know, just understood. Uh, the, how you really have to go about doing it, and yeah. then basically ate just chicken and rice and right. you know eggs for four months or five months straight. So, how old were you at the time when you did this? The first one I've done two. The first one they're drug tested, by the way, so they're they're you know it's nice because no you know, it's not the guys that right. are the big big boys aren't aren't in there doing it. Um, I was about first one was like five years ago now I think at this point. Okay. So on the, the last one was about three years ago. So yeah. it's. It's it's the thing about bodybuilding. Not to get too deep into it, it's an yeah. incredibly selfish sport, and it's not even the time spent in the gym. It's the time spent in the kitchen. I mean, it's hours and yeah. hours. I've so, watched video video on YouTube of some of these professional bodybuilders, and this guy has this whole morning routine. You've probably seen it of like just. He talked about what Tupperware he buys because yep. he's packaging all this stuff up in different things for the day, you know. So I know exactly what yeah. you mean. 
So if any private label is out there, there's a niche market for you. Well, you know, my my e-commerce mind went to that. When you talk about bodybuilding, I'm like, hmm, he's in the baby industry. I would think immediately when you said that, that you, because that's a huge industry, like with bodybuilders taking different supplements, like all sorts of things. Why didn't you decide to go that route? It's a gray market. There's a lot of it is is a gray market in the sense that it's not regulated by the FDA. Mm -hmm. It's an ingestible. You have liability issues from a business standpoint. Uh, you know that's not a road that we we wanted to go down. Yeah, so I mean, I but babies. I mean, babies. I'm paranoid about babies. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean, your nice part is you're working with manufacturers. Yes, you're yes. on their insurance, right? I mean, we have our. I got gotcha. you. know, obviously, we have a million dollar policy or insurance ourselves, but you also work with. Right. Uh, you know, other other folks on theirs. So. Right. Right. Fun. So the train to opera side of things. Yeah, that was definitely from college. So you know, again, following in the old man's footsteps, he he got his degree in uh, operatic performance. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and and ballet, believe it or not. So we're we're kind of our family. Yeah. So mom, same way. She was music history. So I you know I, I went into college on a uh, uh, I was kind of a slacker in high school, and so really the only reason I got into uh, college uh, was on a scholarship, so it was almost like an athletic scholarship because I only had um, a three six GPA. That's not uh, a slacker. Three seven. Well, to get into school that I went went to, it was like the average was weighted was like four point two or something. Oh, wow. so University of Florida was where I went to college, so uh, I got waitlisted, and then I got. It was luckily enough since I was on scholarship for singing, they boosted me in. So you know, I'll I'll yeah. I'll, I'll admit that. I said before that I wouldn't put you on the spot, or may not put you on the spot to <laughs> sing, but if you feel inclined at any time. Um, but I would love to clip something in at the end if you have it. I, I looked, you know, I have to. Mom and Dad just just moved away, so I uh, when I go up, I knew I get that. I looked. <laughs> Excuse. <laughs> um, but um, so the big influence for you, Wes, was obviously your dad, and um, you started with him. He had the durable medical equipment company, and you did some interesting stuff for that company. What what kind of stuff were you doing? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so about 12 years ago, when when he'd been in it for you know 10, 12 years already, uh, we had an opportunity to provide durable medical, like you're saying, wheelchairs, basically custom wheelchairs for folks with severe disabilities. And so I was just out of college, and, and you know we started working together. So I really focused my time and energy on that, and got certified as an assistive technology yeah. professional. And basically, for that's what I did for 10 years was design. Uh, custom rehab wheelchairs for people with severe issues like Christopher Reeve and Stephen Hawking type right. wheelchairs. So, uh, yeah, that was a pretty they were incredible. were working like 10 years ago, right? Or, or more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful because of the direct impact that you have on people's lives. Yeah. And so I still clearly to this day remember a lady that I built a custom wheelchair for her and she was pretty severely obese and so it was really really custom and I was there and it probably took me about five hours to fit this lady once I built it and designed it and took it to her house to try to deliver it mm. uh, but when we finally got it uh, you know she went outside and it's the first time she'd been out of her house in two years holy cow seriously yeah wow. so we went for a little walk together which obviously is not part of the job description but I just loved it and she was so appreciative of you know of that so it was it was really cool to have direct direct patient care basically yeah that is amazing and um, I want to talk about one other thing on that note um, but I don't want to forget I want to ask about when you went online with that company when you started putting stuff online because I'm sure it was brick and mortar for a long time but before you have you have a real interesting fact on an experience with muscular dystrophy yeah yeah no no um, a couple years into the business of, of doing this um, I heard of uh, an opportunity for uh, volunteering at a camp. So Muscular Dystrophy Association, Jerry's Kids, the telethon, you, I mean, a lot of people know about that. Sure, sure. Well, another one of their big programs is MDA Camp. And so what that is is basically for one week a year, you go and you do 24-hour direct patient care with a child with uh, muscular dystrophy. So it's kids that are, oh, it's the age six to 17 I believe is the age of the kids mm -hmm. and I did it that first year and I absolutely fell in love with it it's such a incredible experience I've done it you know I missed a couple years but it's, it's this was my 10th year 
uh, that I that I did camp, and and it's it's really hard to explain. Yeah. Just that, and because I, I was trying to think about this. Yeah. You know when you have a really really close friend that you know you can maybe not talk to them for six months or eight months or three months, and you just pick up where you left off. Exactly. Thing, pick yeah. up right where you left. That yeah. is what this is, but for a hundred attendants and a hundred kids. So it's like yeah. two hundred best friends. Meeting for a week a year, every year, picking up exactly where you left off. Yeah. You know, I think this is powerful to talk about, not just from from a personal standpoint, from also partially from a business standpoint of, you know, seeing probably you see some amazing things of drive and determination in these kids that they are bound to a wheelchair and in horrible shape and they probably have sunny dispositions more than someone who's, you know, so well off. Can you talk about one experience maybe with one person that how that impacted you? Absolutely. No, that's that's a, you, you you nailed it in that it's it's a reality check. You know, oh, I didn't get my Starbucks this morning or whatever. Uh, you know, and you can think about well, there's a there's a young you know boy or girl that's never walked, that's in a wheelchair, that you know the life expectancy is maybe twenty twenty one years, right. and they have incredible disposition on life and just you know are carefree and they love it. It's like oh. Okay, I guess things aren't 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 so bad, and so uh, I'll tell a story. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, trying to figure out. It's 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 a little. There's bodily humor involved in it. Go so ahead. It's, I Shoot. Hope it's not too terrible. You're like looking at me like. Uh. Um, I'm I'm so, up for anything. Go okay, ahead. Okay. So, it, but it has a point. The first year I volunteered at MDA camp, I had a young man who was I think nine at the time. And this is again my first experience. You know, this, I've done wheelchairs, but I've never cared for someone with this ability. Yeah. So the first camp, the first kid, the first night, I was. And we all stay in cabins, so I got to say that. So there's like eight or nine of us in these cabins. Some of these kids, they have to sleep in a hospital bed. They can't sleep in bunk beds like like everyone obviously because right. they have severe issues. Right. So the first night, uh, it's about 3 a.m. and I hear him. And he says, Wes, Wes. And I'm, you know, what? Right. He's like, Wes. Yeah, like, go back to bed. Yeah. And I'm like, Wes. I blanked myself. I, you know, I, I poop, you know, which is, you know, that's what happens. It's part of life. It's vile humor. And so I get up in, and I go look. And he absolutely had. And it was oh, yeah. uh, uh, overflowing the diaper. And, you know, again, it's, it's not a criticism. It's just part of life. But that, you know, but it, and it took me about two hours, two and a half hours to get them all cleaned up, roll them over. You know, this was my first time I've ever done this. So that was like, welcome to MDA camp. You know, <laughs> that was my first experience. But I'll tell you, I loved it. I absolutely loved, uh, loved the experience. And it just, yeah. there's nothing like it. I, I, I would, you know, if there's any uh, filmmakers out there, like small filmmakers, Please contact me. I think it would make an incredible movie, and it's hard to explain without amazing the- documentary. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, definitely. So when did? So I'm going to go back on the e-commerce path for a second. Thanks for sure. sharing that story. Um, and uh, don't listen to the story before you eat. Um, but <laughs> so the e-commerce. When did you first? You're in your dad's business, um, and when did you first go online? Sure, sure. So you remember, there's there's four partners: myself, Ryan. So were mom. they there from? I mean, what point? Uh, the uh, the Tim, the gentleman who invested, was okay. after, but the three of us started. And okay. so Ryan worked at my father's company. Oh, with, really? Okay. With, yeah. Um, and we realized real quickly that it was really difficult to bill Medicare and, and you know Medicaid and these private insurances. So we wanted to get out of that. I'm in the health profession. I understand completely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's it's they very, control you and they can slash your prices and everything else. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, tell some horror stories on that. But yeah, so we realized quickly that we wanted to, um, you know, do something more free market where you're rewarded for what the effort that you put in. Mm-hmm. Um, so like a lot of people, you know, we first just slapped up a website and put every product on there and figured out and figured, you know, people would just come in droves and buy our products. Well, that didn't happen. You know, that never happens. Uh, so got, you know, kind of reassessed and we looked at it and came up with an idea of, of niche niche websites and so we still have that business it's 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 small but websites dedicated to basically one product or a, a line of, of products where we where we fulfill those orders mm-hmm. and so that was really our first experience with with you know customizing a website yeah. 
for search engine optimization for that one key product. What were they? I mean, initially it sounds like there were a lot of wheelchairs. What other durable medical equipment were popular? Sure, sure. We have a couple websites that do uh, wheelchair cushions. Okay. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're not huge. Each site does maybe $250,000, $300,000 a year. So it's not, you know, it's not massive. But to it's some not, people that's really good? It's tiny. Yeah, that is yeah. good. No, yeah. it's, it's definitely. So, it's definitely yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, wheelchair cushions, um, a uh, piece of medical equipment that allows a person to stand who has who can't stand. So it's called a standing frame. Yeah. Um, we sell those. Um, yeah, I mean, there's four or five sites so out there. So which one, did you put them all online at once, or did you say, well, I think we'll choose this piece of equipment and go with that first? What was your thought process? Yeah, no, we, uh, one site, we started with one site as a, as a niche site, yeah. and that was one of our wheelchair cushions. Uh, it's called, uh, the, the type of the cushion called a Rojo cushion. And so mm -hmm. Our website is pressuresorecushions.com. That's a real niche, but you know, hey, if you're looking, if you have a bed sore, or that's pressure, that's what you want. That's exactly what you want. That's so, huge for their quality of life. I mean, it is, and, yeah. it, and it helps that we're not just eat, you know, online not online sellers. You know, we have a history uh, and a background and experience in that, so we're able to not just sell products, but we we can you know help out with with how it needs to be worked and you know other questions as well that we can answer because of our history in, in healthcare. Yeah. So you went from pressure sore cushions, and what was what was the next progression? Well, actually, originally it was the brand name uh, Rojo Cushions mm. was the originally, but we found quickly again you know you you know oh, we People all have buy stuff pain. Yeah. yeah, in that the brands didn't like us using their names in our URLs. I see. I see. So, Trademark issues, so we, so yeah, we had to transition away from that, which was a good experience, you know. So it was that website, and then another uh, web uh, website for wheelchair cushions, and then um, the Easy Stand, uh, the Standing Frame website. As yeah. Well. And so, when did you get into the Lullaby Lane? Well, we had that going, and um, that was like I was saying around the time that we were looking for something with a larger market cap than medical equipment, and so. We identified one specific type of stroller, mm -hmm. tried to implement that model, uh, the, you know, basically the named branded for that one item. Did uh, you start with strollers or was there something else before that? that yeah, we started with that one stroller. And yeah. maybe, yep, just that one. The one that where the person had to travel like miles to find the, to just look at the $700 stroller or was it a different stroller? It was a different one, but okay. it was, you know, similar. It was very similar. And what we were, you know... Not to get too deep into it, but no, you know, go deep at, in it. Yeah. Okay. So we looked at one of the one of the things that we look at uh, when choosing a product was the search volume on a monthly basis. Yeah. And so Rojo Cushions is probably somewhere around thirty thousand for all the unit searches a month. Mm. If that for all the keywords, um, you know the this one particular stroller baby jogger was, I don't know, so like eight hundred thousand or nine hundred thousand, you know, searches a month. So I was like, huh, this is a different ball game. You know, and so you then, go like someone goes on like Google keywords or something and searches the monthly volume. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and it, you know it's a uh, slight tangent off that. The interesting thing is that you know some of my research I've been doing and in, in with consulting is that Amazon to go back to Amazon is now the number one place that people start their product research. Mm. In 2009, 19% of the people started product research on Amazon. Uh, 2015, a recent survey showed 44%. Wow. That's amazing. Research. It's a game changer. It's a complete game changer. So, so is there a service that you like to use to figure out? Because obviously Google Keyword Tool is, is free. Is there a way to figure out the monthly searches on Amazon, like certain tools for that? There is, uh, there is, there's, 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 there's multiple ones. Um, we use a service called Merchant Words. Yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the thing is, is that the the volume is so much more massive in terms of uh, of monthly searches than what's on AdWords in the keyword tool. That you know, I, I'm having trouble believing that it's actually that volume. It could be. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but we don't use it as gospel. We use it more to just to trend. So you see, you look at Google Keywords, compare it to Merchant Words, and yeah. see you know, how comparable they are and just use it. Okay, this is the highest one. Maybe this data isn't accurate, but it's the highest search term or something like that. Correct, correct. And it may be, you know, it may be. We're, we're, you it, know, yeah, you just don't know how accurate it is. No. Yeah. Because it's the, not coming directly from Amazon. You got it. You got it. It's not published information. It's someone's algorithm. So, 
uh, you know, we found in general it works, but again, there's no way to track the specific uh, specific volume. Yeah. So you start with the first stroller, and how does that go? It, it went that went well. We created a website specifically for that stroller, just like the old business model. Uh, had a little success. It was a lot more competitive market than what we were used to with the medical supplies. Yeah. And less so, niche type of. Thing. Yeah. 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 And so that that was fine. And then we said, all right, well, let's try to get a couple more products. But then that was when we really quickly realized that you needed a physical uh, retail location to contract with these manufacturers. And so, you know, why is one, that? For uh, trust purposes, or it is for um, use. You have to bring value to these brands. And so, you know, understanding that these are sought-after brands that people are knocking on their door on a daily basis to mm. try to sell their products. These brands don't really need to contract with anyone. They don't care in the sense that if you say, "Hey, I can, you know, sell a hundred thousand dollars of your product online," uh, but that's all that I'm doing. They're like, "Well, okay, you know, we're not interested." Because Why is that? There's, there's, there's the the channel is already somewhat online is already saturated in terms of where to get product. I see. So you know, if if a brand was worried about someone. You know, typing in and trying to find their product, that's a different story. But people are searching specifically for these products, and there's already mm -hmm. major companies out there selling them. So there's no value to just yeah. selling online. So yeah. we realized quickly that you have to bring other, some other tangible value yeah. to these companies. And so, in particularly, and you have to identify on a per, uh, you know, per industry basis what that is. Per manufacturers, so they, they may have different values yes. that would hit home for them. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a it's a you know trench warfare kind of thing. You got to figure out what these guys want, mm -hmm. and then you have to you know do your best to give it to them to contract with them. And so one of the things that they wanted was a nice retail location for their products to be displayed in. Mm -hmm. And that's one you know we have a really beautiful big old store for that reason. And we do well in it too. I mean we sell a lot of you know product in our store, but originally it was almost just the cost of doing business. What other value surprised you? West that you're like, why do they want me to do whatever it is or that brings value to them? Sure. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. You know, because we're talking online. It's like, you know, we could have a million people do it online and we have, you could search for it online. Retail location, that makes perfect sense. Any others that you could think of that through talking to these manufacturers that added value that you discovered? Well, you know, I, I don't know about a specific thing. More that you are vested in that industry. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to show them that you are a baby retailer. You, know, you, you, you whatever it is, however, whether it's a website, retail location, you know, you have to pass the sniff test. Yeah, not just be someone that wants to buy and sell product online. There's no value to it. So yeah, they want an expert. Yeah, it's a, exactly. It's it's a it's a just a combination of a bunch of small things. Yeah. So it took a while to contract with these guys. But once we did, and then once we the floodgates opened, that's really when, you know, our Amazon sales also just hit the hit the roof because uh, you know, you don't ever have to worry we never have to worry about finding possible product opportunities to sell. Yeah. They're all there. Yeah. I know we were talking, you know, before before we hit record about the barrier to entry and the barrier to entry is a little bit higher, which is good for people, but then if you're wanting other people to do it or teaching other people it makes it a little bit challenging but i guess this opens up how do you help people navigate that barrier to entry that's a great you know that's that's a great question it's you you nailed it when you said that the barrier to entry is high but when you get there it's unbelievable and you know it, it's a matter of one setting expectations ahead of time which thank you you actually helped me with this in our, our conversation you know uh, thinking about educating and thinking about doing you know consulting you know I want to be upfront with these folks and say listen you know it's a lot of money that you're paying for this please understand that uh, this is not easy this is really difficult a yeah. lot of people will probably fail at this but but if you persevere, if you put in the yeah. time, you put in the energy, and you can, you know, you can make it happen. And when you get there, it, it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Is there any advice you have, or what advice you have for people when they, how should they start the conversation with one of these manufacturers? They've identified what industry they want. They've been, you know, identified maybe these three manufacturers. How should they start a conversation? 
Sure, sure. Well, I would I would back up slightly from there. Yeah, go ahead. Once they figure out what industry that they want to be a part of, uh, create a company and you know name it something as what you know. How, it doesn't have to be as blatant as you know Wes's toy shop or Wes's baby store, but something that identifies you as part of that industry. Right. And from there, you take the mindset that you're in X industry. And then when you start that conversation, you're not just someone that is buying and selling online. You are part of that industry. Right. And it permeates your conversation and people people get that. Yeah. You know, they that's that's the you know, they want to see that you're there. And if it's in your mindset that you're in that industry, right. you're gonna be more successful. Yeah. We're not we're not a DME company, we are lullaby lane, so people know immediately you're in the baby industry. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you went from the first stroller. So tell me, when was the first big milestone that you hit online? That's great. Yeah. The so that first stroller that we sold on our own on our own website and in the store. That was you know what happened was Amazon contacted us and said, hey, we want you to be a third party seller mm. on Amazon. I think wow. the reason they did that is because you know Amazon is all about being the everything store. They want people that. They want to offer everything in the freaking world. And so some brands that they don't have access to, I think what they do is find people that do have access to them, mm -hmm. reach out to them. And that's, I, you know, there's no proven of that, but I think right. that's what it was. And so this same stroller that, um, you know, we would sell maybe one to two a week in the store, maybe one to two online, uh, we said, all right, we'll give it a shot. So we listed this stroller yeah and for people who don't know i mean this is like a five or six hundred dollar purchase so like selling two a week is like twelve hundred dollars a week if you're selling you know online and in the store that's like twenty four hundred dollars a week so it i'm just making that note notation because oh he's just selling one or two but like this is a high ticket it's a great item point. so anyways yeah no that's right yeah it was 659 i believe was the retail on this right. stroller Right. And so, you know, we would, like I said, one or two in the store, one or two online. Well, we listed on a Friday over the weekend, came back on Monday, and we'd sold like 13 units. I wow. Believe. So that was like the first like, light bulb. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. So what do you do? So when you see that happen, how do you increase it? I mean, you're thinking, okay, how can we do more of this? What do you do next? Well, yeah, you know, for me, I just started reading. Started reading and started, you know, getting everything I could. Uh, started and getting my hands dirty. You know, let's let's just get in with Amazon. Let's talk to Amazon. Um, you know, there's a lot of information out there online, and some of it's good, some of it's not very good. Um, but the best way for us was just to, you know, roll up our sleeves and start, you know, at learning about Amazon in Amazon. And you know, that's that's really what we did. You know, we spent at least hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last couple of years just educating ourselves yeah. on how to properly sell on Amazon. So you have this one, and this is just one product. Mm -hmm. So what did you do next with introducing other products or to increase this, you know, the sales of this one? Sure, sure. Well, you know, we, we did a little research to understand and, and found out about sales rank, found out about, you know, the basics of mm -hmm. Amazon and then started identifying uh, other products that we could sell that had high sales sales rank um, that on Amazon and so we we looked at selling initially against Amazon retail and found real quickly that we did not want to do that they'll crush you they'll, they'll crush you yeah I mean they they you know like I said some folks say that they share the buy box and they and they probably do in a lot of in a lot of cases and experiences but we don't want to risk that. Like, hey, let's have twenty thousand dollars worth of inventory. How do you know that? Is it does it say like this is Amazon? You know, if someone's like doing research and they see, you know, the baby joggers or something that says this is from Amazon. Like, what's the designation that you know this is the Amazon retailer? Sure, sure. They so when you look on Amazon, you can see it will say you know Prime eligible, shipped and sold by Amazon.com. I gotcha. So you see that you know that that's Amazon. Like, yeah, don't go there. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That for us again. You know, everyone's a little different, but you know, we how we grew is staying away from Amazon. Yeah. You know, again, it's controlling the. Control. How did you figure that out? Did you try it and it just? Yeah. 
yeah, try it and read. You know, try try something, read about it. Try something else and read about it. Try something else and read about it. You know, strategy, you know, and implement, watch. Strategy, implement, watch. Strategy, implement, monitor. You know, so, and we were pretty lucky early on with to run into the bundles and, you know, to have that, all that inventory available and all those different brands available, um, you know, uh, but still, it took us a long time to understand that. And then yeah. when we started doing, at uh, first, that wasn't even FBA. That was just. That's what I was going to ask, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, tell me about the transition of shipping out of your warehouse or shipping to FBA. And then, because there's logistics with the bundles, too. Absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, now if I showed you, we actually have a whole production line on how we do bundles, including, you know, machinery. Um, uh, but back then, I was just working out of our, you know, out of our little stock room in our show in our twelve hundred square foot, you know, uh, uh, store. So we would have You're just picking the bundle. Yeah, up. yep, and just have boxes and boxes lined up along the wall as we as we grew. And finally, we said, "Hey, we need to get out of here and you know get a warehouse and get a you know a main a main um, office." So how do the bundles work now? I mean, do they are they if I picture, are they going to like conveyor belt and it's like something's wrapping them all together, or how does that work? It's it's still manual somewhat. Oh, it is. Okay. We have a, we have a shrink wrap machine and a heat tunnel okay. that we do use for our large quantity uh, uh, SKUs, um, but some of the smaller ones still done by hand. It's a combination. It's okay, a combination. I'm just trying to wrap my visualize what that looks like. No, um, you, you got it. And you ship them all out FBA to FBA, or do you ship them out from your warehouse now with the bundles? Sure, we're about 90, 90 or so percent FBA right now. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the merchant fulfilled stuff that we do is typically because of an advantage for shipping. Um, so for some reason, you know, if, if it's a low margin item and uh, we it doesn't, it's not cost effective to send it FBA and then send it out to the customer. We'll do merchant fulfilled. Uh, we'll also do merchant fulfilled for testing purposes, like for if we test a new bundle. Mm -hmm. We'll do it merchant fulfilled because you can use multiple items, uh, one item, excuse me, in multiple bundle tests. So if I had a stroller and a car seat, I could do a bundle of a stroller and a car seat, a stroller and a sunshade, and use that same base stroller. But then once you find uh, and realize what it's a high selling, you know, SKU or ASIN, mm. and you commit to it FBA. I gotcha. Do you, does someone need you for a second, by the way? I'm just curious. Uh, no, that's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. If, yeah. if you Someone's need to take a, a minute, because I saw the look up, and I'm like, am I inter interrupting a meeting no. that you're no. supposed to be in? Um, so you sold 13 back to Monday morning. So what was the next major milestone with uh, Lullaby Lane? Uh, it's, it was a blur, to be honest with you, since the beginning. I would say probably my first $50,000 month, which was about two or three months later. Yeah. Um, and then, and how many for the fifty thousand dollar month? How many products? Because that was just the one stroller, which is the thirteen, right? So, right. how many products are you talking? Is it still just the one baby stroller, or are there other things? That no, you introduced? I think I had about six or seven or eight products. It's it's again, it's been a while. Yeah, uh, products at the I'm time. I'm dusting off the cobwebs yeah. for a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, and then you know, <clears throat> uh, we I got a cat. You get it's it's interesting. There's we, uh, when you grow to a certain size, I call it the in, hitting the invisible Amazon wall. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah. You grow to a certain size, and you can no longer do it by yourself. And yeah. so there's a point where, because I've talked with other sellers, yeah. I like this too. There's a point where you can basically go in, <clears throat> look at your seller central account, check a few things here and there, and then fully kind of get a fully understanding of where all your inventory is, where all your sales are. Right. At some point, when you've grown enough, you you look up and you realize you've got like ten thousand dollars worth of inventory. It's been sitting there for you know two months or three months right. that you're like oh crap I I can't do this uh, anymore by myself so then's when we started looking at bringing in people and um, you know I was probably doing about a million dollars a year in sales before I brought someone out or yeah. if we there was more people obviously Ryan and and, and Steve but. Right. Uh, I was doing the majority of it. I, it was about a million dollars in sales yeah. a year before we start before we brought someone else on. Yeah, Wes, I think this is a really important point to to hone in on for a second. The invisible Amazon ceiling. At what other metrics do you look at? Like, what should people be looking out for? Like, <laughs> maybe it's a million dollars of sales. Maybe it's X amount of inventory. What are those things that now looking back, you're like, okay, I should have started implementing some things. And looking at these specific metrics beforehand, like what are those? Sure, sure. There are 
there really for us there's 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 a lot but the two main ones i would say yeah. is one is inventory turnover rate so mm. how fast you turn over your inventory mm -hmm. and two is your profit margin mm. so a lot of people <clears throat> you know when they when, when they do amazon sales they think of amazon as a customer so you know if we have you know 300 SKUs and uh, you know uh, some of them win, make money, some of them lose money, but as long as the end of the month I'm up, you know, I'm in the positive, then it's okay. Right. Well, okay, you can do that, but to be a real successful Amazon seller, you got to go skew by skew. You cut, you you cut the ones that aren't working. It's 80 20, that bad boy. Absolutely. Yeah. Always yeah. be focusing on your top performers and yeah. testing new ones. So, yeah, I mean, inventory turnover rates, which is basically the more inventory you have sitting there, the more cash you have just sitting on the shelf, dollar yeah. bills. You know, on the shelf, and then right. yeah, profitability per item as yeah. well. So, at that million dollar mark, you realized, okay, I need other help or software or stuff. What was that that you needed to inject in to get sure. to the next level? Sure. If we could have done it over, I would have invested in software earlier. I think we would have invested for mm -hmm. sure in software earlier. But um, uh, what we brought on was another was another buyer. We call them portfolio managers because, like I mentioned earlier, it's Amazon's almost like the stock market right. where there, you know changes up and down quickly. So we have portfolio managers hmm. that that manage books of business, each of them, and then they have you know their uh, numbers that they're expected to hit profitability and sales. Mm -hmm. numbers. How do you so, find and train a buyer? Uh, you know, we homegrown it. I, I that's what I did first yeah. is train someone basically to do exactly what I did. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, uh, you know, we just we just kinda I think next was a warehouse, one warehouse person, because we started with higher priced items uh and worked our way down into lower priced and higher volume items. Okay. So that was one thing. Uh, you brought in the buyer, which makes perfect sense. Uh, what else needed to be injected to, to get to the next level? More space, for sure. More space. Oh. That's when we moved around, moved and got a new warehouse. Um, and, you know, just gave, gave us the freedom to, to, to have and store more inventory, move more inventory. Because it's all, you know, our warehouse is basically a turnaround center. It's not a traditional warehouse. We just get it in and we have metrics on how fast we can get it back out. Yeah. So that, you know, I mean, it, you also have to be very careful of your, of how you send inventory into Amazon because one of the, you know, one of the things they grade you on as a seller that's not uh, published in your account health is your in inbound inventory issues and the rate mm. percentage that you mess up stuff into them. Yeah. And so that can negatively affect your account as well. So we have to create quality, you know, quality control checks and double checks of inventory. It's, you know, it was really just a whole, it's a whole process that you, that you go through. Yeah. And Wes, you mentioned software. So you would have done software earlier. What software do you use? Sure. I well, recommend others using yeah. maybe that you don't use. We started out with uh, QuickBooks. Well, we started out with um, you know just Excel spreadsheets. Then we went to QuickBooks uh, and Enterprise with their inventory add-on piece. Mm -hmm. uh, that we would have changed that. Definitely would not have done that again if we had the choice. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So we went to more of a pure inventory management uh, recently, um, and worked went to QuickBooks Online because they integrate with each other. So it's allowed us, and we have internal software that we've designed for yeah. to look at age of inventory. Uh, turnover rate. You know, I, I, it's one of the, it's interesting. That's one of the things that I've found with a lot of these big sellers, especially folks that have been around for a while, is they all have their own homegrown software because there was nothing out there that um, you know uh, cr uh, that met their needs. Yeah, people are piecemealing stuff together. Yeah, and it's interesting about Scubana is that Chad, the guy that created this. He was an Amazon seller, and he created his own brand. He had, you yeah. know, did a lot of business. Still is, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I like him. We don't use his software personally because yeah. of the healthcare division yeah. with the best pumps that yeah. we're talking about. So I'm going to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, so I'm going to do a quick word from our sponsor, Scubana, for a second. <laughs> then I'm going to ask you why you don't use it. Actually, so I always tell people, like, imagine if you can combine all the software tools you currently use to run your e-commerce business into one centralized cloud platform at a small cost. Would you use it? Of course, of course you would, you know? Scubana does all of that. I personally use them. And exactly what you were talking about before, Wes, is the profitability of SKUs. 
is huge because I don't know, okay, there's this fees, there's return fees, it factors in all these things, and I can actually look in the dashboard and see what the profitability is without piecemealing like an Excel spreadsheet and trying to figure it all out. So I personally love it, use it. So now I'll give you the floor to, to tell me why you don't use it. Sure. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have another division of our company that is uh, bills healthcare providers or uh, insurance, basically uh, insurance contracts. And we need a very specific software that is con uh, uh, electronically connected to these companies. And so we end up using that software specifically for that purpose. And so those, you know, they, it's such a specialty software that doesn't really talk to anything else. So because of that, we kind of had to you know, build our, one of our own our own software. But yeah, no, at the time before we were doing breast pumps, and this is you know uh, a plug as well, is that I did a ton of research on these different softwares, and uh, there you know there there's a class of software, enterprise level software basically that does most things, and a lot of these guys were charging you know five, six, seven thousand dollars a month. Tens of thousands, yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, I met Chad at a at a sellers conference in, in this this past spring, and you know we got to talking. He's telling us about the software that he's he's designing. And I love it because it has all those same functions, but it's a per it's a very small. It's like fifteen cents or twelve cents right. per you know FBA shipment. Relatively speaking, it's a much smaller. Do so you only pay more if you're selling more essentially? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. it's great. It's good stuff. And so, what type of people you know? Obviously, you do a consulting too. What type of people would you recommend? And we were talking off that obviously you recommend different tools, and that's one of them in your toolbox that you recommend to people. What type of people do you think um, do you recommend using it? Sure. Um, it would almost, you know, Jeremy, it would almost be the as opposed to the type of person, the number of SKUs that you're carrying. Hmm. So, and that goes kind of back to that 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 wall that you hit. You know, I think. I think if you have just a few SKUs, at least early on, even if you have you know pretty significant volume, you may be able to do it on your own because uh, it's pretty quick calculations. We we did that, but when you get over maybe I don't know a dozen, two dozen SKUs, somewhere yeah. around there, uh, whatever your volume is, it's just it's so easy to just yeah. hit that you know hit that hit that that the, the dashboard and check out what's going on. Right. So yeah, that's I mean any seller could I think would would benefit from it. the other part is is that if you're only selling on on uh, Amazon right now, it does integrate into other plat platforms. So eBay, right. you know, Shopify, yeah. uh, you know, it automates a lot of different yeah. things that you don't have to do. Yeah, I don't trust my calculation enough, Wes, to <laughs> to not go with something like that. Um, <laughs> So tell me about what do you guys talk about behind closed doors? Like, so you and Chad, you know, two top Amazon sellers. What is the conversation like? <laughs> That's, you know, we had a little different business models in a sense. Yeah, he, completely he, different. Yeah, he, he built his private label brand. I mean, that was his, I think, his, his and continues to be some of his bread and for butter. For sure, for sure. Um, so That's just, why I want to be a fly in the wall of that conversation. <laughs> you know, the, just the, the difference, and it, it's... The, there's there's common threads that you, that big sellers run into. Yeah. And which is what? Yeah. Yeah. Software, people, you know, Amazon retail, a lot of stuff that that it, it's kind of higher level stuff in terms of um, you know API integration. Like it was interesting. I was at a, a, a by invite only uh, sellers conference hosted by Amazon retail, yeah. and the keynote speaker was the VP of all FBA. And interesting. You want his personal number? Yeah. <laughs> what did he uh, say? Yeah. He. What was curious is that this was all sellers that were probably at least a million dollars a piece. So these were, you know, there's probably 50, 60 of us in the room, yeah. and it was in Detroit. And what was really interesting is that there were two areas that he was that he would had no clue of that he was that they wanted to focus on. One was seller performance, and so seller performance is apparently taking you know, weeks and months, if, if at all, to get back to some of these larger sellers. And the second is knockoffs and brand registry, these Chinese companies coming in or foreign companies, you know, it's probably not, not, not yeah. just Chinese, um, and hijacking product listings. And so they really, and I believe this, they truly had no idea that this was going on. And to me, What do you was, mean by seller performance? Explain that. Oh, so seller central and you have seller support, which helps us as third-party sellers. Yeah. Seller performance 
is the, is the group of people that has no names, no vases, no email address, and no telephone numbers to get to these people. What they do is they look at your account, how you, the health of your account, and if you are not healthy for certain metrics, mm. shipping, late shipping, I gotcha. your account can be risk can risk to being suspended. Yes. And so uh, they're, you know, these big sellers are trying to get in touch with, with, with seller uh, performance and they're just not even hearing back from them. Mm. So Amazon's system has grown so fast and is so automated that there's some real, you know, real uh, kinks that they have to work out. I so I think it's eye opening for this guy. And the knockoffs. Yeah. Also? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And then, you know, how there's so, there's such a, a movement for private label on Amazon that, you know, with any movement, there's always kind of a gray and black market. People abuse things. Yep, that goes along with it. So that is what's happening. And these folks that are doing, you know, six, seven figures in private label are having people come in and, 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 and you know, wreck these product listings. What does that mean? Like, how, how do they wreck product listings? So, okay, so if you're selling. I mean, not to give anyone an idea out there, no, but I'm just no, curious. No. So, yeah. so if you're selling a. Um, uh, if you're selling, I don't know, a, a shower curtain, okay, and it's a very popular shower curtain, you have three different colors, uh, they'll either come in and put their product, which is a different color, on that same listing, or they'll just send their product directly to your FBA listing. Really? Yes, absolutely. It How does that on, even get by, get past? Well, again, Amazon's so automated yeah. that... You know, we uh, we as sellers have the ability to create variations and create parent-child listings. Right. So anyone, I could, you know, theoretically. So it's like me sending some like defunct stroller to your Amazon FBA account or something. Sure, absolutely. And people do that. They'll yep. just send like product to someone else's account. Yep. Yeah, it's it's more again. It's the oh. foreign people that that just send product in. They don't fully know what they're doing, so they can wreck people's. You know, hundred thousand dollar product listing just goes away, or you know, wow. it's, it's really negatively affected by these foreign sellers. That's crazy. So, what else was interesting about that Amazon event? Sure. Um, if, well, it's the first time I've ever seen more than like two Amazon, you know, employees in the room at the same time. Um, but they were, I, I like that they were first, that was the first time they were reaching out to big sellers or to sellers in general to try to understand what was going on. So that part was great. Uh, I took some photos uh, of basically all the pain points for all these major sellers. Mm. And so I, I don't, you know, I have them with me, but I, it's, yeah. it was interesting to see kind of what that the, the common pain points among yeah, folks. I'm sure there were a lot. What were a few that would be noteworthy? Well, obviously the two that we talked about, obviously those were the big ones. Uh, integration, API integration, uh, product searching, um, you know, how our systems talk to Amazon systems. So, uh, you know, MWS, Merchant Web Services, how basically how we are able to connect with and talk to, to Amazon's uh, systems and how what we can do to improve or what they can do. Does that mean like on the back end, what you put in the description or keywords, how that affects the listing or back end of like how do how you drop how you record your sales, uh, how you get your data, how you reconcile your inventory, yeah. how you reconcile your sales. You know, just yeah. that whole that whole aspect. Yeah, yeah. So Wes, now we talk about the invisible Amazon ceiling, right? So the million dollar park, what was the next major milestone that you had to break through for the ceiling? Well, at that point when we were still fairly young, it was all about cash flow. Yeah. You know, when we when we did those bullwhip buys. Because you you're, yeah, you have huge amounts of physical product. I mean, you're talking hundreds of dollars for each one unit. Yeah. So how do you manage cash flow? Yeah. Yeah, it's again, it's that cadence of accountability, buying biweekly or weekly, really just you know ramping that up on somewhat of a slower basis. And you know, at any one time, we probably have near a million dollars in inventory. It's a lot, uh, yeah. So uh, you have to just always make sure it's healthy. So I guess that you know that's, that's so the next thing that we focus on, we design a software ourselves for this, is the in a aging inventory. There's there's reports through Amazon, but I want something that's real quick that right. I dashboard that I can look at and see what the age of our inventory is. Yeah. And so that's another one of the metrics for our portfolio managers is make sure that you don't have any inventory that's over you know ninety or sixty or ninety days. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's really important actually. So the the next one was looking at the 
And, and so what level are we talking about that helps you push through by looking at that takeaway, the aging inventory? Uh, uh, we're between two and a half and three million in sales, I think, at that point. Yeah. And the cash flow. So at what point do you realize, okay, we need something outside or do you just get more credit cards? Well, we don't, well, that's a good, good question. And we don't use any credit cards. Really? We're just no credit cards whatsoever. Absolutely. We don't, don't use any. We have a line of credit from the bank, but we don't use it on inventory purchases. We would use it for capital expense. Hmm. So forklift, shelving, whatever. You know, right. something that you can, that you can depreciate over time. Uh, we we use pretty much the credit limits of our manufacturers, and so we leverage them and leverage that for the for that you know for that sales. Yeah, and obviously you've built relationships with these people over decades, right? What should people be thinking is normal when they're first in with the manufacturer and maybe five and ten years out? What they should they be asking to sure. improve terms? Well, we we only started in baby about that four years ago. So the so those men so those uh, so those relationships are less all of them are less okay. than five, five years old. Just to just to clarify. Okay. Yeah. What you want to do is with you know you want to it's not just about that initial understanding of what the manufacturer wants. You have to and this is another actually thing that Tim you're asking about you know is would his expertise. Uh, he said, yeah, expertise yeah. Is that you know treat these people as partners. They're not just someone that you buy from. They're not vendors. They have hopes and dreams and wants. You know, what can you do to help them get to that place? And they'll be very responsive in helping you to get yours as well. Mm -hmm. It's classic, you know, business stuff. Build the relationships. And so that that's what allowed us to to grow. Yeah. So what's an ideal for someone, like terms wise? Unlimited. I mean unli I mean like (laughs) realistic. (laughs) <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> well, it all depends on the manufacturer. So, like, like I can go someone in, be like, "Oh, this is awesome! I have forty-five days to pay, or two months, or so." What is sure. what should yeah. we think about? Well, you know, every every industry is obviously a little different, yeah. but our, you know, we have our lead time is about eleven to twelve days, depending on the product on average. So, you know, if you have net thirty, and you have a twelve-day lead yeah. time, so when you order it. It doesn't get into the facility or whatever for two weeks or something like that. Yeah, two Amazons. Okay. Facility. Yeah, two weeks. So you know you have to kind of sell through that. If you if if it's net thirty, you know the bill comes you have due. Two weeks. You got it. So you got to sell through it. So you know we try for net forty five, net sixty. I see. Uh, and obviously high term. So if you have net sixty in our way, okay. you, know, you can you can pretty much as you're only limited by the no, the amount of credit that you have. Yeah. Okay. That's what I want to know. Like, okay, should you be, is net 60 unrealistic? Is that realistic? Is, you know, should we only really be shooting for 45 day? You know, so that is helpful. And at what point do you decide we need outside capital? Because you went bootstrap and then you realized we're growing a lot. We need money for inventory. What point should people think about injecting or have someone else inject capital? Well, you know, when we got our first, you know, capital, our first, you know, investment in the company, we were not as sophisticated as we are now in terms of profitability. Mm. So I would say that we, that you know, it, it was, we should have focused on that first, and then if we would have done that, then really it's just a matter of figuring out how quickly or how slowly you want to grow. So if you don't need a capital investment, you can do it without, but you have to bootstrap it and you have to go a little slower. So that's yeah. you know. It's going to be how fast you want to you yeah. want to. That, yeah. That's that's your. Answer. Once you're profitable and you're sure that you're profitable, you know there's for us there's basically an unending amount of opportunity. So it's just a matter of how fast do you want to grow. Right, Wes. This is fantastic. I mean, I could literally take ten more hours and ask you all these questions. I'm looking at it. It's we're like right at an hour and thirty three, and uh, I told you I'd finish an hour and thirty. Um, so maybe just two more things. I mean, you get to, you talked about the. The million dollar invisible ceiling, then the two and a half million. What are the next levels that you know allowed you to break through? Maybe it's a five million, then to the seven million, or whatever that those points are. Um, yeah, I mean, this is amazing. So I appreciate your time with no, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no problem at all. So really, you know, it it, it goes back to that profitability and understanding mm-hmm. if you're profitable or not, and then your cash flow. And really, it's at, you know, then it's the the terms with the manufacturers, and so. It it's incremental at that point. I would say how you grow if you want to make leaps and bounds at that point. Again, you need one of two things: you need cash, 
hard cash yeah. that you can spend on inventory, or two, exclusive relationships with manufacturers to sell their products mm -hmm. still under their credit terms. Mm -hmm. So that is how you can that's how you can build your business quicker too is you know working with manufacturers building these relationships educating them on what you do with Amazon and then ultimately the goal is working towards being the exclusive distributor of their product on Amazon. Yeah. I mean we're still talking even if you do those things right you still have to sell 7 million dollars of product yeah. like what yeah. gets you to like the actual just selling the stuff yeah, it's it's infrastructure. You know, you need you just have to slowly. You probably need an accounts payable and an accounts receivable person at that time. You need you know probably multiple warehouse folks. You know, it's right. you know you have to deal then with with. Uh, I want you talking about this stuff because people think, oh, you could do you know seven million dollars within three years or you know annually, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. You know, so yeah, so hard. I want you to talk about you know just briefly some of the sure. systems in place that allow this to actually work. Sure, sure. Well, obviously, you're not like sitting on your couch, like eating popcorn and watching TV. No, you know, no. So. You know, and the people that say you can, you know, you can do something over overseas and make a zillion dollars, you know, there, no, yeah. there's a gap to it. You can yeah. do that to a point, but you can't. So, uh, yeah, no, you, you're right. It's, it's, again, it's typical business stuff. So you have yeah. multiple employees, HR, health plan, you know, retirement plan, you know, all that kind of stuff. Don't tell me this. This is sounding complicated. No. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and you know, you but you the or you, you you say that right. You, yeah. What you want to do is create a create a great culture, yeah. and that really is the success. You know, I'm fairly smart. My partner's smart. You know, all all these guys are are smart folks. Yeah. Fine, smarts are nothing if you don't have a great you know staff and crew around you that love what they do and like to come into work. So. Yeah. You know what? What we've tried to do is really build a great culture within the company, mm -hmm. and that really allows you to to grow just as much as anything else. Yeah. So for this type of business, what what kind of staff count does it take to put in to to create that infrastructure? No. I, that, yeah, that's another great question. So, and I was just talking with a client about that the other day. So we have. In our company, we have about 22 people, but again, we have a uh, we have that medical side and we have the um, you know retail side. Yeah, you have this whole probably billing stuff that they have to do, it. and that's it. separate from probably the e-commerce and Amazon stuff. Yep, and that's you know what I was thinking about is that if we really really pared it down, yeah, and it was just a bare bones crew and we did nothing but Amazon, yeah. you could probably do that and. Six people, yeah. maybe. Then you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You're thinking like <laughs> Amazon's the only channel. Exactly. Yeah, you want to diversify. You're right. You know, we're probably not going to grow to thirty or forty million dollars on Amazon because you know we want to focus on other channels as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're right, you don't sleep at night if ninety nine percent of your business is on one channel. Yeah. All right. Well, somebody let you off the hook. Um, but I, I love this conversation. You know, and I want you to tell people where they can find you, you know, Lullaby Lane and then Ezonomy.com. And so my last question, since it's the Scubani e-commerce mastery series, uh, my question is, what's been the lowest point e-commerce wise, lowest point e-commerce moment uh, business and what's been the proudest? Sure. Um, let's see, the lowest well, lowest point, which it's, it's good, we haven't talked about this yet, and this was one thing that helped us clean our clean up our act on Amazon. We were doing probably about a million and a half on average of sales a year at this point. We 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 got some information from one of the Amazon seller support staff about weights of boxes that you can ship in. Mm. And even though it's in Amazon's rules that you the maximum weight you can ship a, uh, multiple items in a box is fifty pounds, we had it documented. Clearly, that this seller support person said, "No, it's you know more than that. As long as you do X." I see. We did that multiple times, and they they stopped our selling privileges privileges for three days. Holy cow! Uh, because of it, they we could sell the products, but we couldn't ship anything new into Amazon. Wow! So that cost us like you know thirty five thousand or forty thousand dollars from one mistake that was even documented by Amazon. So that was a like an eye opening. Yeah. Hey, you really got to get your act together and be proactive and be super, yeah. you know, uh, uh, cautious on what you yeah. do with Amazon because it's such an automated system. Yeah. I mean, how do you even avoid that though? Because they told you this, and then you you followed it, and then it, the automated system basically kicked it, 
kicked it, you know, whatever verdict that was. You just you check and double check and probably triple check on what's going on. So yeah. we're lucky. One after that, we've never had an issue with our yeah. account. So yeah. we, that was like the you know get your get your act together. Kind so of. is that just a matter of contacting the right people to show them the documentation or? Uh, you the you we were contacted by our performance team, that seller performance team at the time, and said, hey, listen, you guys, you know, we're going to stop your account. Well, actually, they didn't even contact us first. They just said, nope, you can't ship product in. So we had to contact them, and, you know, then they contacted us back and stuff. So gotcha. That was it. So that was definitely That's low a low moment. moment, yeah. High moment is, I don't, you know, it, it, probably the first time we hit $5 million. You know, in, in, tell me in, about that. Because yeah. it was that was one of our goals again with that 40x. You know, the trying to increase our sales that year. Well, we did it. We hit it, and mm. in a pretty big way, and went pretty significantly over that. So uh, it was just nice to know that you know that kind of stuff's the kind of stuff works, and it actually creates tangible differences in your business. So what do you do to celebrate? Uh, you know, just I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing too big. You go to karaoke and like whip out <laughs> opera, or what? What do you? Do? <laughs> no, that was you know a celebration among the staff. You know, it, it, it's right. not about us; it's about the folks that actually did the other work and put it hard and made it, you know, made it happen. Does so, your staff uh, know that you are a trained opera singer or no? Uh, probably some of them. We've grown fairly, you know, fairly <laughs> fast, so. <laughs> Wes, I really appreciate it. This has been hugely valuable, and um, you know, thank you so much for for sharing your knowledge. Absolutely. Well, it's been valuable for me as well because it's it's not not often that I talk and talk and talk and talk. So you know, you can you know, you can definitely learn something when you're speaking or communicating. And you're a great facil yeah. facilitator of that. Thank you, Wes. You know, congratulations, everyone. Check out Lullaby Lane and Ezonomy.com. So um, I messaged Wes and we had to hop back on because there were two things that we had to talk about. And so we needed to include this. And one is an amazing story, which we'll talk about, which leads into what we talked about in the, in the actual interview. And then the, the first thing is we were talking about some mind-blowing results and things you do for brands. And so I, you know, I wanted to make sure we include that. I had that notated on my notes. And I didn't get to it. So Wes was kind enough to hop back on. So talk about, you know, obviously with Isonomy, you consult with brands. And talk about the El Medina brands story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> you know, early on when we started doing consulting, um, you know, we talked with a local uh, venture capital firm here in Northwest Ohio. And they had invested in a local company called Almondina Brands that makes almond cookies. Basically, they're kosher almond cookies. Mm. And so, um, you know, they're they're a seven figure seller. They they do typical distribution channels, Wal Walmart, you know, grocery stores, Target, that kind of stuff. Um, but they were looking for a new avenue. Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, they they were interested in Amazon. So basically, what we did is I worked with them to on board selling on Amazon. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting because it's different than a typical model. You know, you have your private label sellers and you have third party. Well, there are some brands that are starting to sell directly on Amazon, which to me makes makes uh, you know, makes good sense if you right. if you want to go down that path. Right. Well, what's happened is the the um, sales channel Amazon for them has turned into their most profitable sales channel. So wow. it's not their biggest but at the end of the day, biggest doesn't really matter. You know, it's it, you pay the bills with the money that you bring home, and so that's turned into their right. uh, most in, uh, profitable sales channel. So I've, you know, I've had conversations with some other folks that are possibly looking at going that route as well. They must love you over there. Uh, <clears throat> it was I, I got a lot of free cookies, and that was that was totally <laughs> worth. <it. laughs> Give them my address. Um, All right. So, what do you do? What are some of the key things that you do with onboarding? Well, you know, Amazon, in a sense, is like uh, uh, no limit hold'em poker. Uh, the saying for it is, is it takes a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. Right. Well, that's 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 pretty true. But what we do, or what I do, is 
uh, you know, kind of with that company and specifically different different companies do different things. Right. Uh, it, we did an onboarding and an education on how basically just how to sell on Amazon. So we went through fulfillment by Amazon versus merchant fulfilled. You know, pay per click, search engine optimization, catalog uh, optimization, all the the different basic aspects of selling on Amazon. And so since then, they've they've you know uh, they've wanted to focus on that channel, and it's it's turned out pretty well for them. What do you think? What was the biggest challenge for them? going on Amazon? Well, I think for them and for brands in general, yeah. it's the mindset of selling direct. You know, typically if your sales channel is through wholesalers and through retailers, you just don't have much experience with that direct to consumer model. And so that I think is one of the biggest hurdles that folks, you know, that that, that folks have to get over. Yeah, is that an objection too? Like, what objections do they come? Because I could see them being resistant. They're used to selling through your typical channels, and then you're coming and saying, "Go direct to consumer and go on Amazon." What are some objections you get? Sure, sure. Well, they, I mean, they come to me just as a as a yeah. as a, a difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 easy. It's easy for a brand to, you know, fill one PO from one major company, you know, and that that that's an easy process. That's what they're used to. Whereas if you do it and sell through Amazon, it's not that. It's basically the opposite. Right. You know, you're you're tracking and monitoring hundreds, if not thousands, of sales. Yeah. So it's different, and it's, you know, it's different for every every person and how they want to pursue every brand and how they want to pursue that. But yeah, yeah, we are seeing some brands, you know, take that step, and they're they're finding it very beneficial. Yeah, I asked that because you were mentioning before about mindset, and it takes a little different mindset from what they're used to doing um, compared to what you're telling them. You know, they should add into their their repertoire as well. So. You know, someone who's thinking about, like someone maybe listening to this and thinking about their brand should be doing that, but they're, they're thinking of different objections. So I wasn't sure, is that like a no-brainer for them or are they bringing up certain things that, to you, of sticking points? Yeah, I mean, the, the I would say the technical nature of selling on Amazon. And there is a cost, significant cost associated with educating themselves as a manufacturer on doing it. And so what we found is that smaller brands um, would be more apt to selling directly on Amazon mm-hmm. because just of how the company's set up, there's less folks, they can you know dedicate more time to it. In, in general, that's what we found. So the larger brands are not uh, themselves uh, trying to sell directly on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, have, I want you to tell this amazing story, but before I have you tell it, anything else any other tips or advice on brands going on Amazon? Well, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned it earlier just that, you know, five years ago or 2009, you know, 19%. Did I say this earlier? I'm not sure if I. You mean the searches that. wise or? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, in 2009, 19% of people started their product research on Amazon. So, you know, one in five basically right, started. Right, right. Educating themselves on Amazon this year, 2015, that number has grown to 44 percent. Right. So there's been a pretty dynamic shift in the market to where people begin their product research, and I yeah. think brands just need to take notice of that and understand that that's a real, you know, that's a yeah. real, real number. And they're bypassing Google, they're bypassing Bing, they're bypassing right. manufacturer sites, they're bypassing everyone. They're going right to Amazon. Yeah. So they just need to position themselves correctly for that. You know, for that that change. Yeah, I guess the better question is: Is there anyone who should not be selling on Amazon? Who maybe it's not a good fit. Uh, like if a brand came yeah. to you, you'd probably tell them, "No, don't even bother with it." Sure. I mean, probably your your extremely large brands that are so integrated with Amazon retail, so basically selling directly to Amazon and letting them sell, they they probably wouldn't find the value in it. So, like a Nike. Or you know a Reebok or or you know whatever make up just a ginormous brand. They're so tightly integrated that it, it may not make sense for them to do that. Yeah, yeah. So Wes, um, you know you have a crazy story, or a really amazing story, which kind of feeds back into the muscular dystrophy camps. 
it, it yeah no um absolutely so it's it's kind of proof that you know if you want to call it spirituality or karma or whatever whatever term you use it's it's definitely real and in 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 full effect uh like i said i've been doing you know mda camp for for years now um about five years ago uh one of my favorite MDA campers. It was her last year at camp. Um, she, they only do a certain a, age or something. They only let a certain 17. age. Yep. Oh, seventeen. Okay. Yep, seventeen. So yeah, six to seventeen years old. So it was would have been her last year at camp. Uh, the problem was is the location of the camp changed, and it was three hours from her house. And so there was no way for anyone to get her wheelchair, her power wheelchair, which is, you know, 400 pounds, 500 pounds, from her house Holy cow. to the camp. Wow. So she would not have been able to have gone. So I said, all right, you know, Katie, that's her name, um, I'll take your chair up there. So, so you were going to, like, I rent a van or something? Or what were you going to do? Oh, I had a van. Oh, I mean, you, you, being in the wheelchair, yeah, being in I the wheelchair you. business, I had a I had a van and I had a ramp. So that part of it was set. But, you know, you yeah. still had to drive three hours. Yeah. Um, so I drove her I, I drove her wheelchair up there, put it in the van, drove it up three hours, dropped it off at camp. And right around that same time, she was being dropped off. Uh, and her sister, Allie or Allison, was driving, drove her sister up. And so I met Allie. That was the first time I really met Allie and started talking to her, and you know we'd been we've been friends since then. We'd been friends for years and officially started dating a couple years ago. So I call her uh, the love of my life. So that's proof that you know if you're if you try to be good and do good things that you know you're rewarded for right. it. So I definitely feel rewarded. That's amazing. Yeah, the last thing I would think is you're picking up a girl at a muscular dystrophy uh, <laughs> camp as a volunteer, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, luckily, yeah, she was definitely not a volunteer, but she was, she's a wonderful, wonderful, caring and kind woman. So I feel yeah, pretty lucky. That's amazing. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you Absolutely. again, yeah. Wes. Now, like if people didn't love you more before, now they love you even more <laughs> now. So uh, I really appreciate it and fantastic. Everyone, again, Thanks. Lullaby Lane, Exonomy.com. Thanks, Jerry.